Serve the kingdom locally and all over the world with these mission opportunities. Check out our website and plan to join us for our coming mission trips. We will be having our first fundraiser luncheon on February 20th. There will be a takeout option as well. We hope to see you there. The Abide Women's Ministry invites you to attend our Speed Friending Movie Night. Join us in the underground for fun activities to get to know one another. With great food, snacks, and a movie. Let us know you are planning to join us by signing up on the website or calling the church office. Childcare is available by reservation. Today is the deadline to register for Couch to 5K training. Sign up to begin 10 weeks preparing to complete a 5K with joy. Our goal is not competition, but completion. We will plan to run to the sun on Saturday, April 16. More details to come. The Adult Special Needs Sunday School class meets Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. This is a small class designed for adults with special needs who can participate in Bible study activities. If you have experience working with special need adults, please contact Eric Jimenez. We would love to have more volunteers to be part of our Adult Special Needs Sunday School class. See our website for more information. So where to begin? New adventures abound. A mountain is calling. Your purpose found. Jesus Christ, my living 
It is so good to see you here today. Please be seated. Hi, my name is Nicole De La Cruz McLean. I read this verse that said something along the lines of um, all the hairs on your head are numbered. But I just remember reading that and I remember just thinking like if all the, <laughs> that's a lot of hair. If all the numbers, if all the hair on my head are numbered, then I must be important. And that's where I started realizing that I was important to God. And I wanted to know more about Him. And I wanted to have a relationship with Him. So uh, back in January of 2021, um, my brother, uh, my brother, I got a call that my brother was in critical condition. Um, he'd gotten shot and robbed. And um, I, I immediately, I just, I, I prayed, I prayed to God to, to save him. And, um, and I told God in my desperation, like, you know, I'll, I'll do whatever if you just saved my brother because I wasn't ready to lose him. And um, a few hours went by and I felt this peace, like a weird peace. And um, I get a call from my mother saying my brother was stable. And um, I just knew that you know, God had answered my prayer and the prayers of the rest of my family. Um, so weeks went by and I just had this feeling of being pulled, of being called. And um, that's when I opened up my Bible. I don't know. That's when I opened up my Bible and I started just reading. I started just getting into the Word and it it just spoke to me, it spoke to my heart. I felt like the Bible was reading me instead of the other way around. And um, I just, over time, I just noticed changes in my heart and my thinking and my, like, you know, I just, and I, and I started to just understand that God is so much bigger than, than what I thought. The moment I accepted Jesus into my heart, I think I woke, I like woke up one day and I turned over to my husband and I said, hey, I'm going to, I'm gonna 
um, take my Christian walk more seriously. I, I, I worded it that way, but I think at that moment I just knew that I was ready to profess Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I wanted to get baptized a while back after I accepted Jesus into my heart. Um, I just knew that it was just something I really wanted to do. And the Lord led me to um, First Baptist El Paso. I was walking. I was walking around like doing my normal fitness routine. And um, I ended up walking through these doors. And that's when I met Kara and she spoke to me and we prayed and I started coming regularly. So I just knew that it was something I've been called to do for a while. So I'm excited. It's finally happening. It's finally happening. My name is Nicole De La Cruz and I'm getting baptized today. Indeed you are. This is Nicole De La Cruz McLean and she wants you to know as you have seen that she trusted Jesus as her savior and wants you to know that and she follows him in baptism today, okay? Nicole, because of your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and in obedience to his command, I'm honored to baptize you as my sister in Christ. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Let's worship. They're back, the orchestra's back. <laughs> Aren't you glad you came to church today? Amen. I am. I'm glad you came too. I'm glad I came, but I'm glad you came too. Have a Bible, go with me to the book of Luke, chapter 22. 
and the book of Acts chapter 2. We've been taking a road trip of sorts. I started in the first week of January working into a series that I'm calling Road Trip. It's a study through the book of Acts and we won't hit every verse individually. We'll probably take bigger ideas and jump through. But uh, what, we're, what we're intending to do with that is to emphasize not only Luke's version of the early history of the church as those Christians, the apostles and followers of Jesus that just kind of kept mushrooming out into a bigger and bigger group of people, as they took the good news of Jesus Christ across the known world at that time through Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, the other, uttermost parts of the earth as we saw in that passage. But they, they worked their way around up into modern day Turkey and then over towards Rome and ultimately uh, to Gaul. And it's just an amazing story as we consider how this, this message of hope, the love and the life of Jesus Christ on the lips and through the behavior of those early Christians uh, was contagious, and the church just grew and grew. And today, as a church, we stand as the, the contemporary group of people that hold that trust to take the good news of Jesus Christ into this world. So this is a road trip for us, the gospel on mission, as we prefer to say most of the time. And as we do that, I just highlight this little truth for you. Road trips tend to be forward-looking, in other words, when we plan these trips and are on these trips, uh, we have itineraries, and those itineraries are designed to help us know where are we today, what are we doing today, what's tomorrow, what do we do, how do we, how do, we do it, and where are we going? They tend to look forward. Let me give you uh, three different road trips to look forward to over the next handful of months. I'm going to say, let's just kind of take off a chunk and say over the next six months, you, as a member of our church, will have the opportunity to go to Waco, Texas. That's a little underwhelming. I just have to tell you, you know, you know there's a little Baptist school over there. Um, but we, uh, through our missions committee and our global missions team, uh, and Jeremy, I think, is maybe part of this with some of the student ministry stuff, we're going to send a group, and you might be part of that group. You just didn't know it till today. But we're going to send a group to Waco and do some, some road tripping, if you will, for the gospel. Take the good news of Jesus Christ to some, some things in Waco, Texas. And if Waco's not far enough away for you, then we're also, during that same stretch of time, going to send a group of people to Chihuahua and take the good news of Jesus Christ and go down into Mexico to Chihuahua and do some mission work and some gospel work there. And if that's still not far enough away for you, you can be part of the, church, of the group that goes to Puerto Rico. Uh, during that same period of time. We as a church have long since embraced the idea of the gospel on mission. And we are part of that. And you are part of that. This is Edgardo sitting over here. And if you believe just, just from what I've thrown out there already, God has already said to you, you need to be part of one of those trips. He'll be here after the church and he'll sign you up. Right? That's right. Road trips tend to look forward. But uh, as we do that and we anticipate things with that mentality, we also recognize that there's a, there's a problem with that always looking forward. And that is that we sometimes in our looking forward and moving forward, we tend to forget some of where we've been and some of the journey that we have had. And so snapshots, that's what we used to call pictures, Snapshots help us to lock a moment in time and give us a reminder of that. So, you know, it used to be a phone was something that hung on the wall or sat on a desk or, or a table at your house or at your work. Now we carry our phones with us. I think that's a great improvement until mine won't stop ringing some days or text messages won't stop coming or emails, etc. But you know, one of the things that seems to have happened in our world today is more people utilize their phone for pictures than they do for communication. 
So just think about it. I don't want you to go digging through it right now, all right? But uh, later today, just take your phone out and start flipping through some of the pictures that you have. And if you're like most people, in the process of doing that, you will be reminded of some things that maybe you haven't thought about in a long time. That snapshot takes you right back to that moment. And some of those will make you cry, honestly. Because if you have pictures in there of some of your loved ones who are no longer here, it will remind you of that, a snapshot snaps us back, if you will. But it should also fill you with joy. Because as you go back and you see those pictures, for me, I go back and look at my grand, grandkids and some of the trips that we've had and some of the, the experiences we've had with them. And I go and I see those pictures of those moments and I'm remembered how grateful I am that they live on the other side of the state. <laughs> and how much we love being with them. So we take pictures when we're with them. It takes us back. And it helps us to remember well some of the journey of life for us. Let me give you a little afternoon enjoyment. If you happen to have more than one version of the First Baptist Church of El Paso church pictorial directory, go back and look at the pictures of your friends. Don't look at your own. Okay, go back and look at the picture of, of your friends. We have several of those old ones around the office, and every once in a while I get to look at some of them and I go, my goodness, that person sure got old. <laughs> it's the nature of life, right? Snapshots center us on previous experiences. So today I want us to look at a few snapshot, snapshots in church history. And I think in doing this, what it should do for us is it should remind us of the church's, that's a capital C, the church's journey of faith. So we're going to take these three snapshots and we'll look at them. We'll start with Jesus and then we'll go to the early church and then we'll come to ourselves in the midst of all of that. But I hope that it will encourage you uh, at the point of, of this charge. Don't forget to remember in your Christian life. Don't forget to remember. The first snapshot we get is in Luke's gospel, chapter 22. Now, I'm going to read from verse 14 in just a moment. This is where Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, as we call it. Other churches call it Eucharist or communion, any number of, of things or titles that are used for it through the years in various places. But as we come to the institution of the Lord's Supper, there's an intriguing little um, truth. It's almost a trivia kind of question. How, how many verses do each gospel writer give to the institution of the Lord's Supper? I, it's much less than what I would have thought, honestly. John doesn't even really deal with it like the other gospel writers do. John has a lot to say about what happens uh, in that upper room, or at least that's what we believe that it's happening there, and some of that discourse that Jesus has, John 14 through 17 more or less. Uh, but in Mark's, excuse me, Matthew's gospel, for instance, he gives a total of four verses to this. Matthew gives four verses. Mark gives four verses. So we're going to use Luke's version today because he gives us 10 verses. Now, here's, here's my deal. The fascination I have with that is as, as fundamental as this is in our life as Christian people, the gospel writers don't give that much space to it, but they sure do emphasize it for us. Let me show you what I'm talking about. In Luke's gospel, chapter 22, we begin reading in verse, verse 14, and here's what Luke writes. And when the hour came, he, that is Jesus, reclined at table, and the apostles were with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of, God, of Man comes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them it could be who was going to do this. Three snapshots, same event. 
And I believe that the reason that we find this in all three Gospels is uh, three of the four Gospels and then John's expanded version, I think. But the reason we find it here is because this is a consequential moment for Jesus. As he has those disciples gathered there, I fully believe that they did not totally understand what was about to happen. Well, they had reason. They had information about it. Jesus had talked about it in a variety of different ways for a while. Uh, they even had some, if, if they had been inclined to look at it, they could have gone back into some of the earlier prophetic material and, and at least had some inkling of this suffering servant and what might happen with that. But in, in the midst of this, it's as, it's as if they're there, but they're not totally grasping what happened? That happens to us a lot in church, I think, and in our walk with God. Sometimes we're in, in pivotal moments, consequential moments, and we don't realize it until later, later sometimes. But they give it to us because it's important. If, let me take that phone analogy again in your pictures. If this were a picture in your phone, you should, this should be one of those that you would safeguard in some way, put a password on it or something to make sure that it never got deleted. This is an important moment. And this snapshot in time is Jesus just before he goes and gets arrested, just before he goes to the cross, just before that whole passion event of Jesus Christ that culminates in his resurrection from the dead, Jesus stops and he pulls his disciples together and he says to them in no uncertain terms, do this. That's why we do this. Because Jesus gave a command that we believe stretches to all Christians of all time. It's important. And so it helps us to remember not to forget. Don't forget to remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But sometimes in our march forward, even in our march forward on gospel mission, we can get so wrapped up in the busyness and in the project that we forget to remember. The second snapshot actually comes from the book of Acts chapter 2. I won't go into this much now because at some point in the fairly near future, we'll probably be covering this again. But in Acts chapter 2, after the, the day of Pentecost and the coming of the Holy Spirit and all that's wrapped up in that, in Acts chapter 2 now, we come to this little statement. It's a snapshot set of verses. Scholars refer to these as the summary passages of the book of Acts. Here's how we might understand it. Dr. Luke is the narrator as he puts this history together. And, it, and it's not a full history. We just have these different events in the different lives of different apostles and people around them as they go forward. And it starts off with all the disciples there on that hillside. It's going to end up with a focus on Paul that's been a number of chapters long. But in the midst of all that, the real subject of that is the spread of the gospel of, of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit's actions. Every once in a while, though, Luke will step back from that focus on an individual or a group of people and he steps up and gives kind of a narrator's summary of what's going on. So we follow these in the book of Acts, and we find here he stops, and this is the first one of those summary statements, and he gives us kind of a, just, just this characteristics of what the church was doing and what they were about. That's what we find in, in chapter 2, verses 42 and following. So as I read, you follow along. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. A snapshot in time. We can go back to that earliest generation of the church. And Luke gives us this overview of how life was for them. And rather than go through all of those characteristics today, I want to zero in on just one. It's actually in two different places in this if you uh, go back and check this out. But verse 42 specifically, and they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. Let me explain a little bit of that for you because what we really have here is two different practices that coalesce into a single kind of statement. 
Breaking of bread for them involved what we would call fellowship. We find this also down uh, in verse 46, I believe. Yeah, breaking bread in their homes. This is the idea of fellowship. Now, don't make the mistake of thinking that this makes them Baptist. Okay? Because Baptists, we love to get together and eat. Right? And if your answer to that is no, then just hang around a little while. We'll win you over. Breaking of bread has this connotation of fellowship. And so they would gather together. They, of course they would. They're family. They're new family. Just like we are family, if we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior, we become part of the family of God. And so in this case, part of what they're doing, that one practice is this getting together and breaking bread, eating together. But again, back in verse 42 that one, the breaking bread there has a connotation that includes that one, but it also adds into it what we would call the Lord's Supper. So we find the, here, here's the significance of that. That may be a big, long explanation. You're going, and? Well, here's the and. That earliest group of believers were doing what Jesus had said they need to do. Jesus said to his gathered disciples in that upper room, do this in remembrance of me. And we find them doing it, and they do it often enough and regularly enough that when Luke gives this summary statement of how they were doing, that's included in that. So I'll say it a different way. A practice that the early church immediately adopted based on what Jesus had said in, in the instructions given stretched through centuries and is laid at our feet today. And we take up that opportunity to continue in this generation to be doing what Jesus told us to do. Do this, he said, in remembrance of me. They took it seriously. And we must take it seriously. So the first snapshot that we have looking backwards is when Jesus instituted this. The second we have is in that early church and a series of those meetings where they also did it. And so here we are, the third snapshot. Because as it is today, this snapshot is real time. But by this time tomorrow, this snapshot will be history. I know that sounds a little bit ridiculous, but I don't want us to forget that we can get so focused on the move forward that we forget to remember. And when we forget to remember, hear me very carefully now, when we forget to remember what this whole enterprise of the gospel is, then we could do the right things for the wrong reason. We can find ourselves doing good things, but with absolutely no Jesus attached to them at all. Jesus in his great wisdom essentially instituted this for us so that we would not forget to remember the high price of sin. So that we would not forget to remember the price that sin exacted on him. So that we would not forget to remember that it's my sin that put him on the cross. You're not off the hook. It's yours too. We need to not forget to remember as we move forward, for God's sake, we also occasionally need to stop and look backwards and remember from the earliest church through the centuries, now it's us. It reminds us not to forget him, and more specifically, I would say it reminds us not to forget the sacrifice. Just as best you can, Think forward a little bit. Look forward in your life to when you are the one who stands before Jesus Christ in his glory. There will come that day if you know Jesus Christ. As his child, you'll have the opportunity to spend eternity in heaven. If you're not his child, 
You don't get that opportunity. You have to choose. This life is a preparation for the life to come. And so the price of sin has taken its toll on you and you're separated from God and what he designed for you in life as it's supposed to be. As we like to say here, the love of Jesus Christ reveals to us the life of Jesus Christ, but you have to accept it. It's not automatic. You have to own your own sin problem. I, let me just pause there for a moment. I know in our society today, people really don't like to be called sinners. So let's make it easy. Let's go ahead and own the fact that all of us are sinners. It's not a perjurative term that we throw at somebody because we think that, well, I hope this is true of you. It's not something that we throw at people because we think that we're better than they are. It's about understanding and owning my own sin. My sin put Jesus on that cross. And I never will experience life that God designed for me to have. Adam and Eve in the garden, that was God's ideal. When he finished creating them, if we take the Hebrew of that, essentially Jesus looked at that and he didn't just say, oh, that's good. He looked at it and he said, that's awesome. Look what I just did. That's a road trammel version of the day. He created us for fellowship with himself and sin breaks that fellowship. So if you don't know Jesus in a personal way and have received his forgiveness by placing your trust and your faith in him, if you don't know that, then not much for you to remember today except the historical event. But maybe that historical event with the message attached should be enough for you to go, I need to know more about this. And now we get that gospel mission in work. What do you remember today? Here's why I think this is so important. Paul later, and we'll learn a lot about Paul in the book of Acts as we work our way through. Paul wrote a number of letters, almost half of the New Testament to be exact. And Paul had a lot to say about a lot of things tied to this thing called the Christian life. But in 1 Corinthians, Paul is writing to a group of Christians in house churches spread across Corinth, and they had problems. They were getting it wrong more often than they were getting it right, it seems. And so Paul writes this letter, and he teaches them, and occasionally he scolds them. And so when he's talking about this breaking bread together, they called theirs love feast. They would get together and have this great feast, and they would eat, and it would be a real party for some, but not for all. And then they would tack the Lord's Supper onto that in one way or another. Here's what Paul has to say about this. This is why it's so important for us to get this right. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 27 and following. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned Along with the world, we could continue reading, but here's the point of this. Paul says to them, and by extension, he says to us, what we do here, this remembering process today, is serious business. It's also a worshipful business. I want to get the warning out there, but I also want to put an invitation out there that says, this ought to be one of the high moments of worship for us. It is for me. You know, I, I've told people through the years, I, I love Lord's Supper services more than anything else that we do. And I love the, our music ministry here. Y'all always help us to, to get worship right in the right direction. But when I'm able to do the Lord's Supper, even though I'm involved here, as these men will be, I get to draw a circle around myself and close everything else off and do business with God. It's in this that I'm reminded of God's incredible love. And it's in this that I'm reminded of my incredible sin problem. And it's in this that I'm reminded that that cross event and his resurrection from the dead redeemed me and you. 
It makes me just want to fall down and say thanks. Let's remember well today, shall we? So in order for us to do that, as we transition now into our time of partaking in the Lord's Supper, I want to ask you to do what I just suggested. As best you can, right there in a room full of people, I want you to kind of draw a circle around yourself. Bow your head. Close your eyes. Do business with God. Don't forget to remember. So this is a remembering exercise now, and we'll pick this up in just a few moments. Deacons, come forward, please. Father, as we move into this celebration, help us to remember well, please. If we have been guilty of trivializing your sacrifice, if not by word, then by deed, please forgive us. Please remind us today of the high price of sin and the sufficient supply of grace through your son, Jesus Christ. His sacrifice on the cross is victory over death and is drawing us to your heart, back home with our creator. Help us to remember well. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Before we distribute these elements, I wanna remind you of the way we set this up. This is the first time in now two years, almost exactly, where we've been able to actually pass the trays and to do this. We've been trying to find other ways to do it, and we've used those little kits. And some of you, I recognize, we know that some are still a little bit nervous about uh, the spread of, of corona and the Omicron variant and all those other things that might kind of slip in on us and cause us to go, oh, is this safe? So we've taken all kinds of precautions. As you know, our deacons are wearing N95 masks. They've got gloves on. They're going to pass these to you. If you wanted gloves, you could have had some for this. We want, to, we want to meet you where you are here. Some people have just wanted to, they don't want to pass anything in those little kits that we've done, so we've made those available. And we've asked those with kits to sit on the side. That doesn't mean if you're sitting on the side that you have one or you have to have one. Uh, but I will tell you this, our deacons understand that most of the serving we, we planned on was right here in the middle. So if you're in the outer side and you don't have one of the kits and you're okay with passing a tray, then I just need you to raise their hand, your hand as they come to you so that they can see that so that you can be sure and get a tray, okay? All right, with that in mind, let's move forward. Join me in prayer, please. Father, we're humbled to be here today, humbled to be in the midst of your Holy Spirit with us. We just thank you for Christ and the sacrifice he made on the cross, and we're grateful that we can uh, participate in the Lord's Supper, which he has commanded us to do. Just pray a special blessing on everyone here and for the uh, partaking of bread. For it's in his holy name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
service today that uh, the church I served in South Texas I had a guy come to me wasn't really a church guy but he had been coming to our church for a while and he loved the life that happens in a church body that's moving to honor God and he loved the freedom that he experienced there that he hadn't experienced in life before he met Jesus and he came to me one day and he said pastor you know I love so much about our church but he said I just have to ask you why are you so serious during the Lord's Supper. How would you answer that question? Here's my answer. It was my answer then and it's my answer today. When we come, when I come, let me just make it personal. When I come to a moment like this and the whole design is to remind me of my need for a Savior and then I see that Jesus is the only fix for my sin problem. And he said, do this in remembrance. I don't know how you do that without being reverent. I, I don't understand how it can cannot be something that causes us to just pause and go, I don't deserve this. And yet he gave it. So I think that's a good point of reference for us. I hope that it is a reverent moment for you, a holy moment for you. And so for just a moment, I want to not address you and I want to speak to those who join us who are homebound. So I'm going to talk to the camera for just a minute. But those of you who are at home and cannot be this and be here for this, and maybe uh, many of you are not even members here, but we know that you watch regularly. We appreciate that, and we trust that what we do here is a ministry to you at this stage of your life. We want you to know that as we come to do this, and those of who are our homebound who are watching this actually next week and you've got your kit, uh, we want you to know that we love you and we want you to know that you're still part of the ministry of this church. As you pray for us, we're grateful. We benefit from that and you do too. So God bless you for that. For the rest of us now, we take you to Paul's writings again in 1 Corinthians. And here's how Paul says it for us. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is a cracker. We know that. But it represents, it is symbolic of the broken body of Jesus Christ by his own choice and by God's design so that we might have life. And so, our dear Lord Jesus Christ, we remember and we are grateful. Help us to live grateful lives. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.
take you back to that guy's question. I can be so serious. Well, I gave you my answer, but there's another part of the answer that I would like to share with you. Jesus gives us kind of a foreshadowing in the passage that I read earlier. He said to those gathered disciples, I'm not going to do this again until we do in glory. It's kind of shorthand for what he's saying to them. So in other words... We'll do this again when this world's done and we go to be with him in heaven. Now, the guy's question had this under, undertone to it. Surely there's reason to celebrate based on what Jesus did for us. My answer to that is absolutely. But our, our greatest celebration happens when we're home with him and what a great feast that will be. It'll be noisy and raucous and all of that as we, with our Savior, remember. You know, the last time we did this, this way, passing the trays and everything, uh, we had no idea what was coming and how long it was going to be. So today as we remember the last two years, some of my friends are not here anymore. Some of your loved ones are not here anymore. The last two years has taken its toll on the human race for a number of reasons, but some people have gone on to be with the Lord. We miss them in these moments. But if they knew Jesus Christ, don't be sad for them because they're already where we will be if you know Christ. And that day will be cause for celebration as it is for them today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ. We pray that you would help us to remember, as Paul said, Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it and remember to me. Father, help us to remember well. Help us to get the reverence part of that right and look forward to the celebration and live the celebration in our daily lives because of what you've done for us. And it's in Jesus' name that we live and pray. Amen.
Thank you, man. You may be seated. What we want to do is have an invitation. Doesn't make much sense, does it, for us to talk about Jesus and his gift of salvation and celebrate it and remember it without giving you the opportunity to respond to it if you've not done so. So that's what this invitation time is. Edgardo and uh, Eric will be down here to help uh, us. If you have, maybe you need prayer, maybe you want to join the church, maybe you want to talk some more, maybe you want to give your life to Jesus Christ today. That's what this invitation time is for. At the close of this time, we'll have a video announcement and then Jim Barrett will lead us in prayer. But as you're exiting, as is the custom of our church, we will have deacons at the doors with baskets. We take a benevolence offering every time we do the Lord's Supper. Benevolence for us is not a budgeted thing. We do that out of the free will gift specific offerings and we do those at the close of these services. And our church has a very broad footprint of doing benevolence. And so your offerings at that point help us to do that. So that's what those baskets and those women will be at, at the exits as you leave, okay? Invitation time. Let's stand and sing. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take him at his word Just to rest upon his promise Just to know the same. 